I'm Tom Dewar, President of Education Minnesota, the state's educators union. Education Minnesota, in cooperation with the Labor Education Service at the University of Minnesota, has developed a set of teaching tools to help our leaders and members learn more about labor history and the importance of the union movement for public education. We hope that you can take away from this training today a greater sense of how the story of Minnesota educators and their union connects with national and state labor history. This knowledge can have a lasting impact on our profession and even our personal lives. My family's history in the labor movement inspires me every day. A profound influence on my life was my grandfather, Patrick Corcoran, a Minneapolis labor leader in the 1930s who was murdered for his organizing activities. The sacrifices he made instilled in me the values of standing up for your beliefs and working for the collective good, no matter what the obstacles may be. The work of my grandfather and his contemporaries serves as a daily reminder to me of the importance of our work. The stories and the people you will learn about in this video laid the solid foundation on which all educators stand. If not for them and the sacrifices they made, our union and public education in Minnesota would not have become the national models they are today. I hope this video and the other teaching tools in this project enrich your understanding of the significance of standing together and speaking with a strong, unified voice for public education. Education Minnesota, the union of 70,000 educators. We are teachers, education assistants, secretaries, custodians, bus drivers, higher education faculty, and more. Working in public schools, state residential facilities, and college campuses in nearly every community in the state. For almost 150 years, Education Minnesota and its predecessors have been a strong voice for educators and students. You may work in Ada or Zambroda. Your classroom or work site may look over the farm fields of southwestern Minnesota or be on an urban college campus. Wherever you are, you benefit from our legacy. In 1858, when Minnesota became a state, the notion of public education as a right was still very new. In those days, an educated person was someone who had completed elementary school. Anyone who could read, write, and do simple arithmetic had all the education necessary to succeed in life. The state's first teachers, like St. Paul's Harriet Bishop, faced special challenges. Her first classroom was a converted blacksmith shop. Soon, however, Minnesota committed to making its citizens some of the best educated in the nation, a ranking it still holds today. After achieving statehood, the legislature established what was then the largest permanent school fund in the nation. Many of the first teachers had no education beyond high school, but as support grew across the state for public schools, so too did the commitment to treating educators as professionals. Six normal schools, as they were called, were founded to train teachers, starting in 1860 with the normal school in Winona. They later became state teachers' colleges, and then simply state colleges. Educators themselves decided they needed to organize to increase their professional growth and development. They also recognized the need to advocate for public education. In August of 1861, some 100 people gathered in Rochester to form the Minnesota State Teachers Association, later to become the Minnesota Education Association, one of the predecessors to the union we have today. For 137 years, MEA was a champion of quality in teaching, curriculum, administration, and public education legislation. From the beginning, educators organized at the local level. They formed associations, later to become local unions, to represent them and to address their concerns in their school districts and workplaces. These early activists knew that better schools are directly related to improvements in the teaching profession. MEA advocated for stringent teacher certification standards, which were adopted in Minnesota starting in the 1860s. 
delegates to early MEA conventions debated a variety of important subjects from school curriculum and libraries to discipline in the classroom. Members of the MEA also played an important role in the formation of the National Education Association. For 25 years, the NEA's national headquarters was in Winona. MEA members knew the quality of education was tied to their collective ability to improve wages and working conditions. While more was being demanded of educators, their harder effort was not being rewarded. Many became frustrated at the lack of progress. Often school districts had no salary schedule. An administrator could decide each teacher's pay raise, if any, without having to justify the decision. Numerous school buildings were run down and poorly lit with inadequate heat, ventilation, and sanitation. Teachers who didn't like the working conditions were often told, if you don't like it, leave. Instead, they organized. Starting in 1918 in St. Paul, some affiliates of the MEA broke away and joined the newly formed American Federation of Teachers, which was part of the American Federation of Labor. These mostly urban educators believed teachers had more in common with the larger labor movement than with the school administrators who led other teachers' groups. The activism among teachers coincided with a growing movement by many workers to organize. In the 1800s, as the nation grew and industrialized and railroads linked cities from coast to coast, union membership increased as well. The nation's first millionaires, men like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, prospered, while many of the workers who built their empires lived in deplorable conditions. Starting in the 1880s, working people began to rebel against these robber barons. They fought for an eight-hour workday, safer workplaces, and an end to child labor. By the 1930s, workers were organizing into unions by the millions every year, in textile mills, steel plants, and auto factories. Minnesota was a hotbed for union activity, led by the steel workers' campaign in the Iron Range mines and the difficult and bloody strikes to unionize truckers and warehouse workers in Minneapolis. Their efforts created the middle-class standard of living that enabled many Minnesotans to own their homes, send their children to college, and retire in security. In this atmosphere, the Minnesota Federation of Teachers continued to press its twin goals of stronger public education and better wages and working conditions for educators. Members held rallies and handed out leaflets. They talked to lawmakers and wrote letters to their local newspapers. Some even went on strike. Walking off the job for any worker, but especially a public school teacher, was risky business. In 1935, as thousands of workers demonstrated demanding a voice on the job, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act. The NLRA made it the policy of the United States to encourage collective bargaining. It set up a process for most workers in the private sector to form unions, negotiate contracts, and strike if necessary. However, the NLRA did not extend to public school employees or others who worked in federal, state, and local government. So when St. Paul public school teachers walked off the job in the fall of 1946, they risked losing everything. Their courageous action was the first organized strike by teachers in the nation's history. Frustrated with falling down classrooms and a lack of textbooks and other basic materials, the St. Paul teachers called it a strike for better schools. Though their action was illegal, the teachers won many of their goals and kept their jobs. One reason the St. Paul strike succeeded was public pressure. City officials were embarrassed by the massive media coverage the walkout received. 